they returned national heroes, something no one had really expected. In 1978, the All Blacks had gone to Britain shortly after being thrashed by Australia at Eden Park. Most were expecting the worst, but these players proved everyone wrong. They achieved the Grand Slam. We went away from here underrated and uh, with bad, possibly uh, press criticism, public criticism. Uh, We've achieved what we wanted to achieve. We've done something that no one else has been able to do. So let's give the side full credit. They have done it, but this is a day that we must all never forget. Dalton! Andy Dalton! It took a series of last-minute heart-in-the-mouth escape acts. But somehow, time and time again, the All Blacks got there in the end. For the first time ever, New Zealand had a Grand Slam. Like most modern All Black tours, the Grand Slam started here at Auckland's Poinamu Hotel. In 1978, it's where the team assembled for a tour which in the end had everything. A bit of mud, a lot of glory, plenty of drama and excitement. A tour full of memories, especially for those who were there. This is becoming a habit. It is. It's twice in a month. How's this disposable income of yours? <laughs> And more than a decade later, it's back to the Po for a few jokes and jugs and stories retold about the tour most of these players enjoyed more than any other. The Grand Slam success was based on team spirit and the friendships are still obvious today as memories of 1978 flood back. A tour which came alive 29 minutes into the second game against Cardiff when a young winger from Wellington left the Welsh in his wake. The All Blacks Lovely. had Cardiff Good stunned. Done. New Zealand rugby players were running Welshmen off their feet. It was how their coach, Jack Gleeson, had wanted them to play from the beginning. I'm leaving here, I'm leaving these shores with the hope that we can move the ball. Uh, I'll still say, even though we didn't play well against Australia in the third test, uh, that we've got backs who want to run the ball and they've got the ability to finish it off. Aiden's up that one, Loveridge to Dunn, Jaffray, Williams up and in, Wilson, flying for the corner, Wilson, what a try! The Gleeson philosophy was certainly put into practice. The All Blacks were not only winning, but winning friends with their exciting approach to rugby. Wilson, what a try again! It's, it's easy to go on tour when you're just a fresh boy off the block. I mean, the Welsh and the Brits and the Irish and the Scots had seen the team selected, the 30 guys, and they knew guys like B.G. Williams, Bruce Robertson, Doug Bruce, Bill Osborne, you know, our star backs. Then suddenly there was this little 21-year-old whippersnapper from Wellington called Stewie Wilson, and of course, people don't know who you are. They don't know if you can sidestep or swerve or which are, you know, which, which are your good points. And so you get a bit of freedom early in the, in the early matches. That freedom saw the All Blacks cruise through their early games with a certain amount of style. Everything was going to plan nicely. Then came a visit to Ireland and a province called Munster. It's a place these All Blacks will always remember. I remember the first time Stewie came in outside second 580, he went backwards about five yards. Didn't want to come in, I think he kept calling and calling him in. No, 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 kick it, kick it hands. Yeah, it's the only game of rugby I've watched that I've seen that we were lucky to lose by nil. It should have been minus. <laughs> <laughs> I think the old adage that we were lucky to get zero was probably about right on the day. Uh, Munster were... Uh, um, the day didn't go particularly well from us. I think we left someone behind after the... the uh, after the uh, team meeting before we departed for the for the match and we left someone behind in the hotel and that was sort of a chapter of errors we'd had a bad preparation uh, the two previous days had been spent uh, in typical fashion in Ireland with social engagements and uh, uh, I think the match was just an extension of the social function That's right. the Munster men weren't in the mood for a social occasion even though an all-black victory was supposed to be a foregone conclusion the local 15 played as though not only their lives, but the lives of all Ireland depended on the result. Christy Cantillon scores for Munster. They got the result they wanted. So here's a chance for Munster, right on the whole back line. Kenneth puts in. Ward waits 
That's Ward. A drop at goal. Twelve points to nil. The All Blacks had been beaten. So you promised you weren't going to mention it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, still have nightmares over it. Uh, probably a game they like to forget, but uh, give them credit. They, they they committed themselves. I'd say 200 percent. They're there early at the game. They're, all, all they're focusing on obviously was their their number one. This was their number one day in Ireland. Um, I'm glad it was Ireland, not Wales. Munster thought they were the world champions because they'd beaten us. So we had, we had a toast to them every game after that that we won and we, we toasted to Munster, the world champions. <laughs> Stu Wilson came up with the theory that we had uh, been beaten and there was nothing we could do about the results, so we should win the aftermatch and try and get some rewards out of the days. So the All Blacks arrived in Dublin for the test against Ireland without their unbeaten record, but with a new approach to the game. And we've probably become a bit more conservative maybe use the, the kick a little bit more to get the ball in front of us and get the forwards going into it and uh, you know a little more cautious about what we did with the ball out wide. The new game plan called for the tactical master, first 5'8", Doug Bruce, to take control. The All Blacks lost Brian Ford early in the game through injury, bringing back Brian Williams into the test arena. It had been the first time the great BG had ever been dropped to the reserves. Number 20, and that's the strange sight to see him come on. You know, having been part of the All Black Test team for such a long time, it, it, it came as a, a blow for sure. But in, in retrospect, I realised that I hadn't been playing uh, as, as well as I might. And uh, if you don't play as well as you, you can, then uh, you deserve to be dropped. That's what I tell the boys nowadays anyway. <laughs> this game was more about grind rather than glamour. And as the minutes ticked away, the result seemed certain to be a hard one draw. But with less than three minutes to go, the All Blacks revealed the Houdini streak, which would achieve so much on this tour. Dawson on his own. Dawson! Andy Dawson! Right as... Probably the thing I remember most was um, well, how hard the game was. It was a very physical game, as Irish uh, tests usually are. But I remember coming back from having scored it and after initially being concerned with the ref had seen it amongst that mess of bodies but um, coming back and just seeing Billy Bush's face about perhaps 10 metres back from the goal line on my way back uh, was just uh, completely lit up you know and uh, it was probably then I realised that you know maybe that had won the won the test. The first test had been won thanks to the All Blacks late late show and Dalton's dive to the line. There were repeat performances coming up, another last minute victory and another dive. The All Blacks played 18 matches on the Grand Slam Tour. Two of them ended in controversy. It was no surprise that the controversy was all in Wales. Since the days of black and white rugby, the Welsh have had a love-hate relationship with the All Blacks. They would love to beat them. And they hate the fact that they haven't done so since 1953. It all makes for a pretty fiery relationship, and 1978 was no different. With both sides desperate to win, early on there was a bit of sorting out. However, it was the All Blacks who were paying the penalty, putting them behind from the start. And before the match minutes were into double figures, the All Blacks needed a new fullback and goal kicker. Clive Curry's jaw was broken. His tour was over. Brian McKechnie's time had come. By rights, he shouldn't have been there. A late replacement for the tour in the first place, he only came into the test reserves the morning of the match. Fairly intense start to that game. Um, fairly heated on the paddock and, and in the stand as well, from what I recall, there was a few words said amongst the Welsh spectators and ourselves early on um, and then to see Clive go down all of a sudden I'm told you better get down in the tunnel and get changed and then I'm on so you never really get a chance to to get wound in it too much and all of a sudden you're out on the park you know. Daddy Holmes beaten by a JJ back there half of New Zealand with him by this time the All Blacks were in trouble 9-0 down trouble with this All Black team had already shown against Ireland, they weren't the types to give up. He's going to be there, but what a try! I did get a little bit uh, 
jubilant at the times when, I think this was the time when, you know, showmanship might have come into it because I remember punching the ear, which, you know, it cost me a few pints afterwards. I mean, you know, normally you go back and shake hands and go, well done, well done. But I got a little bit carried away because you know, it was a, a winning try that turned the game around for us. But time was running out. Two points behind, three minutes to go. The All Blacks had their last attacking chance of the match and for a couple of players their minds went back to a conversation 24 hours earlier. Talking over dinner the night before with a group of the guys there about some of the things Colin Meads has done during his, ga his day and it came up that Ian Allison had actually been prompted by JJ Stewart in a Taranaki King Country game to uh, put one over Colin Meads by falling out of the line out and you know, uttering a Taranaki war cry or something of that sort as he fell and obviously bringing his, the referee's attention to the fact that, that maybe Meads had uh, resorted to what he had to resort to at times when he couldn't out jump the guy and that is to, you know, to manhandle him and uh, you know I, I, I think probably the suggestion was made then well you know we should remember that thing you know sometimes we may need it. The discussions from the previous day crossed my mind and I went out to um to uh, have a chat to, to Murray and suggested that that's what I was going to do and he looked at me with sort of a cross-eyed uh, type of approval and uh, I went back and told Frank Oliver what I thought the, the, the appropriate uh, tactics on the, for the line-out should be and, uh, um, and the, the, uh, the result was we got a penalty, however. The only way through. Then came oh, perhaps the most talked about line-out in rugby history, a line-out which Andy Hayden wasn't in for too long. Windsor. Holmes. Penalty, is it? Yes. Hayden was pushed out of the line-out. Oh, was a terrible obstruction on the day. <laughs> it was a shocking show. I think I've still got arthritis in the, in the shoulder from it. It's no secret that Hayden's dive was self-propelled, and it's obvious that Frank Oliver fell to the ground rather dramatically. But the penalty was for Welsh lock Jeff Wheel's hand on Oliver's shoulder. It might have made me a little bit more famous than I might have been otherwise, but having said that, then I think that uh, people have asked me on, on, on numerous occasions, and they still do, and I think that a lot of Welsh people feel uh, quite upset about it, but upset for the wrong reasons. The fact that uh, we should have won is neither here nor there, really. They say that, uh, well, they shouldn't have dived at the line-out and, and, and got a, a penalty goal in that manner. You know, the penalty was for Jeff Wheel leaning on Frank Oliver's shoulder then. OK, there was nothing gamesman like about how we won the game it was won because uh, you know one of the Welsh players actually held on to one of the New Zealand players in the line out. The Welsh test, big incident, well, have you any regrets? About what? About the incident towards the end of the game. Oh, my only regret is that we didn't win by more. The incident uh, didn't concern you afterwards? What incident? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, would pref I would prefer it wasn't on my record. Uh, but uh, then again, I'm quite happy to go along with the other guys that celebrate the successes of the tour and say uh, um, that uh, 1978 was a Grand Slam tour uh, and had we lost in Wales, it wouldn't have been. Uh, there are a few, uh, if, and if that was a contributory factor to it and we managed to turn a 10-12 loss into a 13-12 win uh, and that was part of it, well then, uh, so be it. The fact that two of them came up at the same time I mean, I, I was a fairly strong bloke, but I don't think I was that strong. But having said that, um, you know, to beat New Zealand, really, you have to be on top of them for the whole 80 minutes. I think one must uh, look round, look back and say, well, we, we played very well, but we just didn't quite achieve the, the result that was uh, was required on the day. And the lesson I, I learned was that New Zealand would never beat until the final whistle was gone. Let's hear how the crowd reacts to this one. Three points to win the match. It was set up for another all-black escape act. I've been going through my mind that the game was that close that it could well come down to a goal kick. And I never actually saw the line out as such that developed, but I'd been feeling confident about the game. I'd been striking the ball really well. As soon as you strike it, you know if you're going to if it's going to go over or not. I felt good about it, yeah. And that's why I probably put fist in there, because it's a relief. McKechnie! The Welsh had been beaten. The headlines couldn't take that away, and the Grand Slam was still on. Next on the hit list was England, a match that was about as exciting as the two New Zealand tries. But a test victory is a test victory, and there were plenty more last-minute dramas in store. Next up came Scotland and the chance for the Grand Slam. Announcing Mr Jock Strap. <laughs> 
<laughs> they run politely, Kath. <laughs> For those who were there, the lasting memories of the 78 Tour are not necessarily the achievements on the field, but the friendship and the fun off the field. The sight of Stu Wilson standing on a chair in a court session, later on in the court session, I must admit, with a, a very large uh, plastic container full of cold icy water at about 11 o'clock at night in a little Welsh hotel and I think going through the high diving routine that we'd previously seen at one of the Olympics, you know, and finishing up in this bucket of cold icy water in and, and a pretty cold Welsh night, you know, those sort of things that will, you know, you'll always remember. By the time the team was preparing to take on Scotland in the Grand Slam, they'd developed into a very close unit with tremendous spirit, much of that coming from the top. Captain Graham Murray, with the other senior players, formed a great partnership with coach Jack Leeson and manager Russ Thomas. Men with similar ideas about what tour success meant. I don't think losing some games makes a tour a failure. I think it's the goodwill you've created, it's the comradeship within the team, the contacts that you've made and the good name that you've given New Zealand overseas. That's what is success. We set out right from the start of the tour to make sure that we had a good team spirit, because good team spirit we believe off the field would give results on the field, and that's exactly what really happened. Scotland didn't start too well for the All Blacks. Their try line hadn't been crossed since Munster, 11 matches previously. Well, now the All Black defence simply fell over as Bruce Hay scored for Scotland. Because of a refusal to bring the kickoff time forward, the All Blacks battle for the Grand Slam continued in the dark. With three minutes to go, conditions more suited to possum hunting than international rugby, the Scots shaped up for a drop kick to draw the game. The Grand Slam needed another of those late rescues. People on the stand, I don't think they knew who scored the try, and uh, I think Graham Murray um, went up and congratulated Brian for scoring a try. <laughs> the All Blacks scored a breakaway and have taken the Grand Slam, and here come the victors. They had achieved the Grand Slam. Ireland, Wales, England, Scotland had been beaten. They weren't the best All Black team to visit Britain, but thanks to character and spirit, they had done what no other All Black team had ever achieved before. It was a great reason for a party once they got their breaths back. I've never been so exhausted after a game and I was just very happy to sit down for half an hour afterwards and uh, wasn't so worried about, uh, uh, about the Grand Slam. I was just being grateful that what we'd set out to, to do had been achieved. But the tour was still not over. It was back to Wales and a match against Bridgend. It was an unpleasant match. One incident in particular will always be remembered. The Welsh and Bridge End captain, J.P.R. Williams, was lying at the bottom of a ruck, refusing to let go of the ball. John Ashworth's boot was the persuader. And in the age of the slow motion replay, the evidence didn't look good, as John Ashworth was tried and convicted nightly on television sets in Britain and back home. It was a, um, a high energy game and um, there was tensions there, of course. I went over the ball to free it in the manner I've done it um, all my life and um, the unfortunate fact um, the contact was, uh, was made with JP um, in that manner. I could accept it being an accident if it was just once, but uh, to be kicked twice I think uh, there was something premeditated about it. Uh, I don't bear any, any long term malice, but it was, I, I've met John Asper since, I played in the veterans tournament over in Bermuda against him last November, so it was just one of those things. Robert Turangi, look at this! Back. One of the saddest aspects of the Bridge End incident was that it dominates memories of the game rather than this brilliant try. The best of the tour and a testament to the ability and determination of the non-test players. There was one more game to go in Wales against the Barbarians. Tradition insisted it be a free-flowing affair. This was a chance to end the tour on the positive note it deserved and players on both sides did their bit for goodwill, even the night before the match. You've just seen one of the great All Black tries. Phil Bennett was playing for the opposition, and I know one or two of our players had actually been out on... the guys that weren't playing had actually been out having a drink or two with some of the, uh, the opposition team, and I can... You know, people say the teams don't get on, and, and maybe it wasn't a good period in New Zealand-Welsh relationship, but 
I think Phil Bennett actually finished up staying in our hotel and uh, my rec recollection is that Brad Johnson booked Phil Bennett into that hotel that night as Mr Treetops. Reece. Mr Treetops and his Barbarians teammates were doing their best to make this game a spectacle. Reeve. Well played Barbarians. As well as doing their best to give the Welsh crowd what they wanted, the scalp of the All Blacks. Elgin Reese, a big Brynmore Williams dive pass. Neil Hutchings for Slemmon. But this Grand Slam side weren't too keen to fall at the final hurdle. The All Blacks provided a fitting tribute in this match to coach Jack Gleeson, whose health on tour was getting gradually worse. He was to die of cancer the next year. But before he died, he had the joy of producing a team that did the Gleeson philosophy proud. And in perhaps the most fitting act of all, this last game was decided with 30 seconds of the tour left. The All Blacks Late Late Show was complete. Started from a good scrum, from a good pass from the halfback and gave me all the time really. Terrible pass by trap on the halfback. I don't know how I caught it. And then I actually was going to run blindside but no one was waiting. Obviously it was all worked out that I was dropping the goal. Um, so it was just the spur of the moment and yeah, pleasing, absolutely pleasing to end the tour on a note like that. I think the strength of the side was really its, it's social cohesion more than anything else and, and its ability to sit down and talk things through and to plan and then having done the planning to actually put the plan into action that there were no divergent groups trying to play a different type of rugby or trying to, to follow different social aims or different, uh, you know, just a different strategy on the tour. It was a very tight group of people, there were 30 players there. I think the goals were well defined and I think every player had made a commitment to support those goals and, and that was the strength. In terms of uh, individual talents, probably not the best side um, I've been a part of, but in terms of commitment um, and uh, uh, setting an objective and, and going for it, uh, absolute tops. Uh, I think we realised we had some uh, inefficiencies, perhaps even going back to the 1977 tour through France where a lot of those guys had come from. And it uh, was very well led by Graham and um, Jack Gleeson and uh, absolutely committed to, to the goals that we'd set at the start of the tour. They came back pleased to be home with friends and family after three months away. The team was breaking up, but their place in history remains intact. They're the first and still the only All Black team to win the Grand Slam. And it's still obvious today, they certainly enjoyed themselves in the process. Mile, mile,